Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being with me on this kind of a spur of the moment broadcast. Watchful was busy. I uh, don't think he was available to join me. He he really enjoys his time with his wife, and they were probably dealing with the farm. So when this video is recut, it'll go on my solo channel. So for those of you watching, if you're not subbed to my solo channel, that is the main reason I'm still broadcasting by myself on our Two Witnesses live channel is I'm trying to build the followers there because there's only maybe 100 or 200 there. So in due time, I'll start broadcasting there when I'm solo. But for now, I like being with you guys each night and Watchful and I are live almost every night of the week except Friday and Saturday. So it's I can't really ask him to uh, come on with me when he really commits a lot of time already with working on so many things. But I was thinking about reading some scripture tonight. And I was, before doing that, I was sent a video by a colleague of mine that it takes a lot to blow my mind. And this, this did. It's really interesting. For those of you who don't know who Ron Wyatt, Ron Wyatt is, he's the one that uh, first found the Noah's Ark on the top of Mount Ararat uh, back in like the 70s or 80s. There's no question about it. It's definitely there. For those of you who have not looked into that, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. It sits right where the Bible said it would. And what's even more fascinating is it measures exactly to the exact what it said it would in the Bible. I forget the measurements, but it was like so many hundreds of cubits and et cetera, et cetera. But it's absolutely fascinating. For those of you who have not watched the, um, the videos on the Noah's Ark that they found there, it's really incredible. In Turkey, they've actually turned it into a tourist park attraction. So... Again, if you haven't seen any of that stuff, it's really, really worth watching. And I say that to say this. Ron Wyatt must have a special connection with Christ. Because he found Noah's Ark. And after watching this video and watching the interview with him, I'm totally shocked that... This was not bigger news when it happened because this video is old. It's like 1994. But he has a fantastic reputation. And just like when he found Noah's Ark, uh, the news didn't make a big deal out of it at all either. So it's interesting. What fascinates me the most about this is that when he found this thing, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, in this cave, it had like a, a black gooey substance covering it. And I'm not going to give you guys too many spoilers to tell you how that black gooey substance got on it. But it turned out to be blood. And I'm going to play the video clip of him just talking about going to the lab at Israel where he had that blood tested. And the blood turned out to be the only blood in recorded history that when they tested it only had 23 chromosomes. Now, for you science geeks that understand that, that's mind-blowing. For those that don't fully understand that, when a child is conceived, each parent um, contributes like 22, 23, or 21 chromosomes to the baby. So you end up with uh, I think it's 46 chromosomes. This blood only had 23. Only had the mother's side of the chromosomes. And the people in the lab had never seen this before. So it's... <laughs> and I think I got the audio to play back. It, it played before I went live. So if it doesn't again, you know, the enemy is really fighting with me. But guys... I'm not going to play the whole video. The video is in the description, but I just want you to hear what 
he says, Ron Wyatt says uh, uh, about it's the original uh, taping of him when he was talking to the uh, the lab. It really put uh, it, it was pretty chilling for me. First of all, in this analysis, I took the blood into a laboratory in Israel. I asked one of the people I work with in, in antiquities, where is a good laboratory that does reliable work? And they said, such and such, such and such. I took it. I just said, please examine this blood and tell me what you can tell me about it. All right? They said, well, look, we're going to reconstitute it. We're going to put it in normal saline and keep it at body temperature for 72 hours with uh, gentle swirling. All right? That's their business. That's great. I said, now, I want to be there when you check it out. They said, fine. So I was back. They checked it out. I said, now, uh, they said, it's human blood. We can tell that. They did whatever tests they need to do. And then I said, take some of the white blood cells and put them in a growth medium and keep them at body temperature for 48 hours. And they said, well, that'll do no good because it's dead blood. I said, would you please do that for me? And they said, okay, we'll do it. So anyway, I said, I want to be there when you take it out and examine it. So I was back there. They took it out, examined it under the microscope, and the one technician called the other one over there, and then they called the boss over there, and they were talking Hebrew a mile a minute there for a little bit, and they looked at me and they said, Mr. Wyatt, this human blood only has 24 chromosomes in it. Everybody else has 46. You see, 23 from your mother, 23 from your father, 22 autosomes from your mother, 22 autosomes from your father. You get an X from your mother, you may get an X or a Y from your father, all right? This blood had 23 chromosomes from the mother's side, one Y chromosome only. You see, the ch a child could not have developed if they hadn't had the autosomes from the mother. So all of his physical characteristics were determined by his mother's side of the family, her autosomes. His maleness was determined by this one Y that came from the source, not a human male. Then they said, this blood is alive. And then they said, whose blood is this? I said, it's the blood of your Messiah. I'm going to stop it right there. But I have studied and followed Ron for a number of years. He's not a liar. He's a, he's a well-respected man in the community. And, you know, when he was hard at work doing this, I was blown away about his uh, Noah's Ark discovery because I had been researching where they had found it. But I had never seen this before. And this video goes into more detail. It's super fascinating because how the blood got on the Ark of the Covenant it is just as chilling as the actual blood being tested. So I know some folks are, you know, skeptical. And if it was anybody else, anybody else reporting this, as far as the man on the video, I would definitely be skeptical as well. But Ron found Noah's Ark exactly where it was. He wouldn't have gone on camera and said that he found what he found if that was not the case. And there's documented evidence from the lab reports in Israel that tested the blood. So, maybe you guys, uh, maybe it didn't affect you like it affected me, but I had never seen that before. And I thought it was extremely compelling. The fact that they actually tested the blood and it had 23 chromosomes 
or 24, whatever he said, that's next to impossible. The only way that it can be is that is the Messiah. Uh, someone born without a, a father, only given birth through the, the divinity of Christ, you know, through the divinity of God. So there you have it. I, I just wanted to share that with you guys. Wanted to know what your guys' thoughts were. And the the uh, the whole video goes into some really fascinating details. But to give you an idea, I'll kind of give you, this may be a spoiler, but the cave that the Ark was found in was found underneath the top of the hill where Christ was crucified. And how the blood got on top of the Ark is that the cross that was put into the ground, the ark was underneath of it in a cave, maybe 10 feet below the surface. And the, and the blood from the cross had trickled down on top of it. And man, <laughs> it still gives me goosebumps thinking about it, guys. I know some, like I said, some folks are going to be skeptical, but my discernment tells me this guy's not lying. And the fact that they suppressed this information for this long, <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, I guess it's no shock. But I have friends that have toured um, the Noah's Ark in Turkey. And that right there, for me, 100%, that is exactly the boat. They have carbon tested the petrified wood from that boat. They recently had some new technology scans, some PETA scans and a few other things that they did that showed the inside of the boat that's buried in the hill. It shows the different rooms. It's just fascinating. They found boat anchors. Uh, actually, not boat anchors. They were used to hang over the side of the ship during rough waters. But these big, massive uh, stone support anchors i think because they throw one off on one side and throw one off on the other and it keeps the boat stable during rough waters it would have a big hole drilled in it so if you guys haven't seen any of the stuff on noah's ark <laughs> it's uh it's pretty incredible but the same man that found that found this it's pretty compelling so what's your guys thoughts on this i'm gonna wait for you guys to uh comment before I continue on, because I'm really interested to see what you guys have to say. Yeah, Ty said in all the graves. Yeah, it, it, what's really fascinating about where Noah's Ark is, is there's a small, like, uh, village, and I think, I forget the name of it, but it's tied to Noah. But there was tons and tons of graves, and they believe Noah's house that... It, you know, after they got off the boat where he set up camp, he built a house. And um, that must have been where the first generation or two uh, flourished from. Because the amount of graves there, there's hundreds. Um, for me, I love this stuff, guys. The If you haven't toured Israel and had a tour guide there, it's the most incredible place you can ever go to. There's so much biblical structure still standing there that it leaves goosebumps on you everywhere you go. Um, you can visit where Jericho was. Um, it, the walls from Jericho are still standing in some places. It's really, it's, it's fascinating. You can also visit where they think Sodom and Gomorrah was, which was right off the Dead Sea. And there's five little areas there that they believe were the five uh, towns where they find these sulfur balls that are not found really anywhere else in the world. And these are uh, essentially brimstone that they have found. For me, this stuff is just fascinating. I mean, it's just fascinating. I, I can't, you know, say another word to, that describes it. And it's um, it's just incredible. 
Yep, let's see what you guys have to say. Floor says Ron Wyatt. Yeah, Ron Wyatt. Um, for folks that don't know who he is, he's uh, an archaeologist. I'm not sure if he's still alive. I can't remember. Uh, all the videos that I've seen of Ron Wyatt, they were 20, 30 years ago. He found Noah's Ark, I believe, in the 70s, early 80s. And the video we just watched, that was from the late 90s. So he's he's actually done a lot of research when it comes biblically. The same gentleman that sent me this video about the Ark of the Covenant has a, a dozen or so more of other archaeology. Uh, I can't even say the word. Words are hard. Other findings that Ron has discovered over his ventures, and they it's, that stuff is just uh, makes the hair stand up on the back of my neck. I mean, God is just awesome, and it, it's you know when you look at it on the timeline of you know how far time goes out, it was just two thousand years ago, and it. In the grand scheme of things, it was just like yesterday. And if you go to Israel and tour that area, and I recommend anybody that has the means to do that, it is so worth it. Everything that we read in the Bible, so many different things. You can visit all the spots that they talk about in the Bible, and so many of them are still standing. So many of them are still still standing. You can actually get baptized where John the Baptist baptized Jesus. They do baptisms there regularly. That exact location where John the Baptist baptized Jesus and amongst other people, they have set it up as a tourist attraction. And you can literally go get baptized at the exact same spot that Jesus did. You know, I try to tell this story to other friends and family, and they look at me like I have a third eye. They're like, why are you telling me this? I'm like, so anyways, let's see here. Someone said that the shroud of is Jesus selfie. <laughs> you know, uh, L.A. Marzuli, uh, L.A. Marzuli that's coming on the show He's done a deep dive into the shroud. He's got a lot of data on that. Let's see here. Hey, Chris, happy to see you guys. Um, didn't expect us to go live. Yeah, I wasn't expecting to either, but, you know, I'd, uh, I got kind of excited reading and researching what uh, a friend of mine sent about the Ark of the Covenant because I, I didn't know this. I know that Ron Wyatt had found many other things. But the fact that he found this and had the blood tested, why was it the news making this like first page news over the years? I mean, that's a pretty extraordinary find. That it's it almost proves the divinity to Christ for atheists and stuff of that nature. There's no human blood in recorded history that only had half the chromosomes, guys. <laughs> So, but, you know, it, uh, I guess the reality of it is that's a, it's a big duh as the enemy controls mainstream media and they best to benefit from everybody thinking that this is a fairy tale and a myth and stuff of that nature. But, you know, uh, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to have a harsh truth reality check. Not sure if it's going to be soon or if it's going to be down the road, but there's not going to be any unbelievers. You guys and I know this. There's not going to be any unbelievers in the end. Everybody will be a believer. The only difference is we will be living in grace and harmony with joy where others will they'll be gnashing their teeth. And I hate to put it like that, but that's the stark reality. I wish I could, you know, change people's minds. But there's so many people that I talk to and witness to that look at me like I'm a nut job just because I'm trying to explain my faith. 
I don't go overboard, you know, with all the prophetic signs, but, you know, I do try to witness to them. And it's, and it's interesting to see the pushback that you get, especially from your family. Some of my family just tell me to mind my own business. And these are people I've been close with my entire life. So, anyways, I was thinking about reading some scripture. If you guys have some um, scripture or where you want me to look, I was just going to open the Bible and just randomly pick a section. But if you guys have some interest in a specific section that you wanted me to read, I am all ears. All ears. You guys have any questions while we're sitting here figuring this out? Paul says, planting the seed is very important. I agree. You know, the people that are blind, they're not blinded because they want to be. They're blinded by the God of this world. And I have to remind myself of that. And the only person that can change that is God himself. He can remove the blinders. But the seeds do have to be planted. The seeds do have to be planted. All right, George says Psalm 35. Let's see. <coughs> All right, Psalm 35. The Lord, the avenger of his people. Plead my cause, O Lord, with those who strive with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for my help. Also draw out the spear and stop those who pursue me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Let those be put to shame and brought to dishonor who seek after my life. Let those be turned back and brought to confusion who plot my hurt. Let them be like a chaff before the wind, and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Let their way be dark and slippery. Let the angel of the Lord pursue them. For without cause they have hidden their net for me in a pit, which they have dug out without cause for my life. Let destruction come upon him unexpectedly, and let his net that he has hidden catch himself. Into that very destruction let him fall. And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. I shall rejoice in his salvation. All my bones shall say, Lord, who is like you? Delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him. Yes, the poor and the needy from him who plunders him. Fierce witnesses rise up. They ask me things that I do not know. They reward me evil for good. Did I say that right? They reward me evil for good to the sorrow of my soul. But as for me when they are sick, as for me when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting and my prayer would return to my own heart. I paced about though he were my friend or brother. I bowed down heavenly as one who mourns for his mother. I like that. Good choice. All right. What else you guys got? Next verse. Let's see here. All right, you guys have another verse you want me to read? We read Psalms 35, Matthew 24. Okay. Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple.
Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another. That shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming? And of the end of the age. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that are you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginnings of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up from to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, and will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will be abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Yeah, I like Matthew 24. Let's see. Uh, Rome 5. Let's see here. Yeah, Isaiah 43 as well. Not sure if I've mentioned this, but my favorite Bibles, and no, they're not a sponsor. I just love their Bibles. Um, but if you don't have a Humble Lamb Bible, they are the most incredible Bibles, uh, I think, that are on the planet. It's... Um, I'm totally a, a junkie for their Bibles. They, there's not a Bible like them. The everything about them, uh, from the texture to the wording to the fonts that they use, they're just incredible. They stay sold out literally all the time. Like you have to put in a, a order for them and then wait, which is what's crazy. 16, 16. My second favorite Bible is those um, keyword study Bibles. They're Hebrew Greek. Yeah, Hebrew Greek. I like those because you can see what the original scripture meant. And there's notes from scholars that give you their personal translation as well. So those are really, really good Bibles to use if you really want to make sure you understand um, exactly what you're supposed to be reading because you know the Bible was written in in a, an original like Hebrew Aramaic and uh, sometimes the translation can be a little uh, unclear because sometimes there's not words in the English language that actually describe the original meaning um, to the T so sometimes folks can um, they can be slightly misled if they don't truly understand what it is. Keep talking and losing my place where I'm supposed to be looking. <laughs> All right, so Romans 5. All right. Romans 5, faith triumphs in trouble. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Those who also 
we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that the tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance, character and character comes hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Yeah, that was a good one. So, what's some of your guys' favorite Bibles? Um, I'm telling you, if you don't have one of these guys, these are phenomenal. I love um, the, the texture on the side. The thing that I think um, that I love the most is just how the the texting is orchestrated in here. Um, all the chapters have somewhat of a chapter title, uh, like when you're reading the commandments. Um, I love the fonts that they use. The paper is fantastic, but the feel of the book is just incredible. Let's see. Um, I like the bright colors. You know, a lot of people like the old school traditional dark colors, but I like the oranges and the yellows and whatnot. I don't know why, but for, for some reason I do. I think it's because the darker colors, they look a little too traditional, like traditional Bibles for me. And I like that um, kind of modern look to the book. Let's see where we... Trying to see who said what next. Jonah 3. Come on. George says, I prefer physical older Bibles. Yeah. That being said, my parents gave me all the Bibles from our family. They had tons and tons and tons of Bibles from over the years. My grandfather was a preacher. Probably the most awesome man you would ever meet. Uh, a lot of my cousins also watched the show, and they would tell you the same thing. The most humble man you've ever met in your life. Not a fragment of judgment ever came out of his mouth. Love was his language. And um, I have his Bible that he used to preach from. I have a older Ethiopian Bible that's about a thousand years old that was passed down in the family that has all the original canon text, um, Book of Enoch and all that stuff. But yeah, the older Bibles, they're fantastic because without a doubt, you you have almost this sense of non-corrupted text change. But I haven't really seen... Um, any of that in the new Bibles either, which is, I think that's why I'm so picky when it comes to Bibles. But the owner of Humble Lamb, he's, he's very special. I've been emailing them and saying, hey, look, I'm going to start mentioning your Bibles on the show. If you could send me some Bibles and I'll give them away to the viewers. So he hasn't responded to me on that yet, but he may, he may give me like a set up a special link for the show so that there's a referral system where if you guys want one of the books, um, you can click the link and it, they'll be able to track that it came from me. And then however many Bibles that are bought that totals up to him giving us a book, he'll send me some Bibles and then we'll give them away some sort of contest or something like that, that, you know, folks in the community can receive them because, you know, money is kind of scarce right now. And these Bibles, they're expensive. I'm lucky that, uh, you know, my birthday had just passed and I had told everybody I knew, hey, I want a Humble Land Bible. So I ended up getting a bunch. <laughs> I, I only expected maybe one to come through, but then many came through. But, uh, you know, I'm not going to complain on that. Let's see here. I forget what I was looking for. I think it was Jude. Seventeen. 
But for those who have kids, these action Bibles, they're phenomenal. They're scripturally accurate. But it reads like a comic book with pictures and just tons of stuff. It's really, it's, um, it's pretty cool. I recommend it for folks that have kids because, you know, smaller kids have the uh, attention span of a gnat and they need pictures. So when I read to my little girl, she, um, she really loves reading um, that action Bible just because she loves looking at the pictures. Let's see here. I'm looking for Jude. I have it here. Now I've... No, it was not Jude. It was Jonah. Anyways, I'm just going to read from Jude because I have been looking for it. So, sorry guys. So, greetings to the call. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James, to who those who are called sanctified by God the Father and persevered in Jesus Christ. May you have mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exonerating you to contend for your faith, which was once all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into lawlessness and deny the only Lord, our God, our Lord Jesus Christ. I think when you guys said first John, first John, all right, all right, so first John. What was heard, seen, and touched? First John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that external life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is the light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice with truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all our sin. And if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to clean us from all our unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Yeah, it's a good one. I like first John. So I'm trying to see what questions you guys have. Yeah, Chris Rayner says, I'm speechless about the blood on the ark. Yeah, uh, that's kind of where I was, man. I had I was unaware of this video. Again, I had a colleague send it to me. And, you know, I've seen a lot of uh, Ark of the Covenant videos. So it, at first, I was like, all right, I'll, I'll entertain it. Just because I like learning. But then I noticed that it was in reference to Ron Wyatt. So that really perked my interest. And then about halfway through it, when it really started to shed light to what was going on, my jaw was dropped. I put the link in the description to this video. It's at the very top of the description. You're going to want to watch this in full because essentially, I've already said this once, but I'll say it again. The Ark was located underneath the cross in a cave inside the hill. So... 
What I don't know is where it stands today. I'm not sure if they removed it, you know, because that video was made 20, 30 years ago. But in the video, Ron Wyatt, they opened it and the Ten Commandments was in it. <laughs> He's, um, so that was fascinating to me. Yeah, uh, Paul said, Chris, I think Wyatt discovered blood type. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. What about those people that were were struck down dead that went into the caves after Ron? Yeah, there's, you know, <laughs> again, a fascinating video. And Ron Wyatt's got a lot of videos of his uh, adventures. What's interesting for me is why aren't these more talked about? Because you really have to dig just on the Noah's Ark stuff. And I know I've already said this, but you figure that this this would be like mainstream news. This is, this stuff's a big deal, but as we've already said, you know, the enemy who controls the media does not want this information to get out. That much is clear because they benefit greatly in the deception. If folks really, you know, the ones that are on the fence and lukewarm really start believing, that's not good for them. Not at all. Let's see here. So he found it to be, do you think Trump really has the ark now? <laughs> You know, Samantha, that's a good question. I, I don't know. It's really hard to truly know the truth when it comes to any of this stuff happening in present day. I did see that Twitter post with, um, they said was a duplicate of the Ark and the Covenant that Trump had made. But man, it looked legit. And something else that I found interesting is in that picture of the Ark in his house in Mar-a-Lago, there was a, a mirror nearby and there was a massive reflection of a bright, bright light reflecting off of the mirror towards the camera. So I found that interesting. Not sure why, but something told me that meant something. That's as much as I can tell you. But if you guys haven't seen that picture that they posted, that Trump posted on Inst uh, not Instagram, Twitter, of the quote, quote, duplicate um, Ark of the Covenant that he has, look at the mirror in that photo and that bright light that's reflecting out of it. It's, uh, it's interesting. All right, let's see here. What else you guys got? How did the Ark get there? I'm not sure. There was uh, several artifacts in that cave. You guys want to watch that video. Um, matter of fact, Ron Wyan has a whole playlist on YouTube. Now that I've come across this video and, you know, I thought for the longest time that he was only connected to Noah's Ark and that was just like a one-off thing. It's clear, <laughs> extremely clear now that God was using him. And so I'm going to go and I'm going to look through all his videos because I think there's a lot more to it. I think he's um, sharing this stuff for a reason. Let's see here. What do you guys should please spooky somewhere? What's happening today? Ch -ch -ch. So what other questions do you guys have? I'm not going to be on long tonight. I just wanted to come on, chat for a little bit, um, do a little bit of scripture reading. Ooh, one thing I have that I thought would be interesting is I have this book, Exploring Bible Prophecies, which has um, pretty much all the prophecies that have been fulfilled. Might wait for Watchful on this just because he wants this to be a part of the show. But this is a, bo a, a book worth getting if, if you guys are not aware of it. I think I got it off Amazon. 
but it's exploring Bible prophecies. It literally has, I think it says 500 prophecies from God's word and connects the dots on tons of them. So this is worth buying. You know, one day maybe we'll read um, all the books left out of the Bible, like the Book of Enoch, all of the, uh, you know, apocryphy and stuff of that nature. But I'm going to answer any questions for folks that um, have questions. I put a list on the website that uh, kind of outlined what I felt like was the important things to add to your prep list. And guys, you know, I'm not going to harp on it because I definitely do not like fear mongering. But please, put together a plan. I know everybody is strapped for cash. I get it. But make it a habit to add to your list every, every week when you go to the store. Even if you only have to do $10. You know, buy 6 $7 worth of cans and $3 worth of a case of, of water. Roger says, so during the rapture, what would say to Jesus if he asked you if you'd like to stay? I definitely don't want to stay. You know, um, I definitely would love to be up there, be with a family that have passed. I'm excited for heaven, guys. The only reason I would uh, want to stay is if my wife or any loved ones were not coming with me. Um. I worry about that a lot. You know, I'm sure everybody knows someone that you you care a lot about, that you worry about their salvation. My wife is one of those. You know, we've been married for a long time. We met in 1996. It's, you know, our oldest child is 17. And I haven't really told many people this, but... She was one of the ones that went cold in 2020. And it's something that I struggle with. You know, we were a part of each other's lives every day for a long time. We would talk on the phone literally 25 times a day because we've been married for so long, you know, two decades. But in 2020, when that shift happened, she was one of the ones that went cold. And... It hasn't gotten any better. I try to be loving and patient and understanding with her. I really don't, you know, chase after her, pressuring her. Uh, but something shifted. You know, we used to talk all day long, back and forth texts on the phone. We'll go all day without talking until she comes home from the farm at the end of the night. She'll leave from, for the farm in the morning and half the time won't even say goodbye. And it's just not me also. It's, she's like that with everybody. Her friends, her family, even the kids. So, uh, you know, all I can do is pray. But it's tough when, you know, uh, someone that's been such a big piece of your life uh, is, you know, you don't communicate with them anymore. It's tough. You know, I used to ask her questions about this and that to try to find out what happened. But it's it's clear that this was just what was in the cards. You know, God has blessed me with many, many things in life. I, I know everything can't be perfect. But it's tough to, to see the person that you've been close with your entire life shift. And, you know, my belief in theory on what happened around 2020, it's, it's pretty simple. It, my, my theory is simple. Those who had their feet firmly planted with Christ, they grew closer. Those who did not have their feet firmly planted with Christ, 
shifted a different way. I don't think there's many lukewarm people left. I think you've either grown closer to, uh, to Christ or you've pulled further away. I think it was, um, he was calling his people. And yeah, so this is the first time I've really talked about it. And I, I'm not sure if I should have just because it's not really something I wanted to make public, but it is what it is. You know, Watchful is blessed that, you know, him and his wife are close. Um, many of my close friends have uh, wonderful wives and my wife has been wonderful. Um, you know, she's been a great wife over the years. We're very loyal, both of us. But, you know, something happened. You know, I'm sure other folks can attest to seeing other loved ones as well that had that shift around that time. But, you know, it is what it is. You know, I have to remind myself that you know, it could be much worse. Job had it really bad, you know. Satan killed all his kids, everybody. So, it could definitely be worse. But, you know, I won't give up. You know, I'm kind to her and, you know, always love her. But what do you do? You know, when it comes to something like that, you can't pursue someone that doesn't want to be pursued because you end up just pushing them away even further. You know, for a little while after that, you know, I was trying to figure out why and I did pursue her and it did not work out well. She definitely did not want to be pursued. And I'm sure anyone that's been in a situation where that's similar to that, you can't apply pressure. All you can do is just be supportive and, you know, be loving. I'm not sure how in the end it will work out. Who knows? You know, I pray to God about it every day. Um, but I don't audibly hear God's voice like some people. But I pray. But I have to keep in mind that everything happens for a reason. You know, it's all part of God's plan. So I just have to trust whatever's going on is part of his plan. Whether that means that she never comes around and, and eventually she ends up uh, going about her own way and I just have to accept that. And maybe God puts someone else in my life. I don't know. I, I'm not a person that believes in divorce. You know, I've been married um, for the better part of my adulthood. But you can't make someone stay either. So I guess it's, this is one of those things you just have to uh, trust God on. That's why I don't get beat up about it. You know, it used to bother me, but now it, it just is what it is. You know, if you just, if you focus on it and dwell on it, it can drive you to insanity. So that being said, I'm going to uh, probably get off now and go help with the kids because uh, it's usually just me and them and they, you know, kids are high maintenance. I love them and would never want anything to change, but those of you who have kids, especially a seven-year-old little girl, they are a handful and it's a circus. So a lot of the time I have to get up in the middle of the streams while Watchful is talking or whatnot because I have to go deal with the circus. <laughs> uh, last time during the stream, I had to cut to the other screen and get up uh, while Watchful was talking because I smelt something burning and it was my seven-year-old trying to cook macaroni with no water. <laughs> Man, we're lucky the fire alarm didn't go off. But anyways, let's see here. Chris, follow your moral conscience, the Holy Ghost, who will never lead you the sheep away. No, I, I, I understand, guys. You know, it's, what do you do? All I can do is be patient. I have been patient. That we're, you know, we're going on the fourth year of this shift so it's it's not something new that I'm dealing with. You know, I've 
I put my time and energy um, into the show, into my day job. I try not to think about it. I pray about it, but what else can you do? If you apply pressure in a situation like that, it does not end well. Everybody knows this when it comes to uh, that type of situation. I'm sure everyone else has known folks that have that has shifted. It's tough when it's someone very significant to you. But again, you know, the fact of the matter is it's happened for a reason. That reason, I still don't know. But I have to trust his plan. It used to sadden me greatly. You know, it, for about the first six months, I really struggled with it. But to be frank, the being so involved with the word and building this community and everything else I have going on, interesting enough, it's probably the happiest ever ever been in my life, which is hard to say because I'm, I'm missing a piece of the puzzle that's supposed to be enjoying that with me. But uh, the joy and the happiness is there. And I thought I was going to be lonely and whatnot because of it. But honestly, being so um, deeply involved with my relationship with Christ, there has been no loneliness, which is a first for me because throughout my entire life, before I was married, I was always seeking a partner or a mate. And I think it was because my relationship with Christ wasn't truly formed as part of my daily devotion. But that desire to have someone with you all the time totally dissipated once I focused on a personal relationship with him. I know that sounds kind of cheesy, but it's not. It's just the truth. So it's it's been a learning experience. And we'll just have to see uh, what God has in store for me. But everybody, have a great night. And Watchful and I will be on tomorrow at 9 o'clock. This week coming up, Craig Bong is coming back on the show. He's going to be on Tuesday. Dr. Greener on Monday morning. Um, a gentleman named John who has had a bunch of NDEs. I know a bunch of NDEs. How many times can you near die? This guy had like five. Uh, I'm sure some of you have even seen some of his videos. He's, his name's John. I'll have to pull his last name. But he's going to be on the show Wednesday. And then Kip is on the show Thursday. So everybody have a great night. And we'll see you tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Hit the like button, by the way. <laughs> Bye, guys.